From Kroll, you're listening to Altlook, the alternative investments podcast, a series focused on key market, valuation, regulatory, compliance, and other nuances of alternative asset investing from various perspectives, including those of fund managers, general partners, investors, limited partners, regulators, and other interested parties. In this first episode, Kroll's David Larson talks about what is meant by fair value and why it is such an important measurement basis for alternative investments. I'm David Larson, a managing director in Kroll, formerly Duff & Phelps Alternative Asset Advisory Practice, and a member of the Kroll Institute. I began my career more than 37 years ago as an auditor at KPMG. However, for the past 25 years, I've been involved with clients, regulators, standard setters, all in the alternative asset industry, working with some of the world's largest private equity and venture capital managers, sovereign wealth funds, and institutional investors, such as public pension plans. I have served on FASB's Valuation Resource Group as a private equity representative as fair value accounting standards were being issued and revised in 2007 through 2009. I've also served in the AICPA's Private Equity and Venture Capital Valuation Guide Task Force that published a 670-page guide after five years of work in the fall of 2019. I've served as the Vice Chair of the International Private Equity and Venture Capital Valuations Board, or IPEV, and have been involved in drafting the last four versions or iterations of the IPEV valuation guidelines. And I currently serve as a member of the International Valuation Standard Council's Standards Review Board. I'm a CPA and hold the CEIV, Certified in Entity and Intangible Evaluation, and ABV credentials. Duff and Phelps has grown tremendously over the years, in part through acquisitions like the one we made of Kroll in 2018. As our products and services have grown, so too has the number of brands which we were being used by our various service lines as we approached the market. The use of multiple brands in the market did not allow for a unified message, and clients didn't always link our brands together as the same firm helping them. As a result, we are reuniting all of our services and products under the Kroll brand. So we will be known as Kroll going forward. Kroll is the world's premier provider of services and digital products related to valuation, governance, risk, and transparency. By unifying under the Kroll brand, we are able to represent a full suite of services to provide our clients a cohesive approach to delivering solutions to the market. We work globally with clients across diverse sectors in areas of valuation, expert services, investigations, cybersecurity, corporate finance, restructuring, legal and business solutions, data analytics, and regulatory compliance. Kroll has nearly 5,000 professionals in 30 countries and territories around the world. But while our name has changed to Kroll, our alternative asset knowledge experience that has been synonymous with Duff and Phelps for almost two decades has not changed. Our new logo, the Kroll Lens, allows us to leverage our collective expertise to provide our clients with a broad perspective. We give our clients clarity, not just answers, in every area of business. In a world of disruption and increasingly complex business challenges, we help bring transparency to our clients and promote good governance. Under the Kroll moniker, we will continue to deliver a seamless experience across our full suite of services. Kroll is uniquely qualified to provide insight into the alternative asset industry based on our extensive experience working with investors, managers, regulators, and standard setters. This being the first in our alternative asset podcast series, the first episode, try to give a little bit of background on really where our bread and butter comes from, that valuation focus. That said, as we expand and come to other episodes, we'll talk a little bit more about governance, regulation, and other areas of investment within the alternative asset space. We work with more than three-fourths of the, the largest private equity funds, more than half of the largest hedge funds, and a great number of institutional investors across the world. So our perspective in focusing on alternative asset fund managers and institutional investors 
is really derived from looking at tens of thousands of private debt and equity investments and working with standard setters around the globe, actually, to pragmatically, consistently, and robustly value um, private investments for the good of investors. This podcast series, as I said, will not delve just into the nuances of valuation, but also other aspects of alternative investments, including the regulation and governance. So what do we mean when we say alternative assets? Investments that can mean different things to different people. When we say alternative assets, we're really focused on investments in private or illiquid debt and equity instruments, either directly or through investment funds. They can be considered buyout, which is often later stage investing, venture capital, early stage investments, hedge funds, which could be a combination of debt investments, private debt, liquid debt, private securities, liquid or uh, publicly traded securities, credit funds, again, would be focused on, on debt investments, real estate, infrastructure, and funds of funds, actually investing in a group of funds of these types that I've just described. Investing in alternative assets has long been a portfolio diversifying and return enhancing technique for investors such as high net worth individuals, public and private pension plans, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, endowments, family offices, and other institutional investors. And actually during 2020, 2020, the regulatory door opened a bit in the United States where retail investors may now have the opportunity, and there's a number of managers out there trying to bring various types of investment vehicles to market, where they may have the ability to invest through their 401k plan into certain types of private equity or private equity-esque investments. But because of its private nature or the private aspect of alternative assets, Many nuances are not well understood. And today we're going to focus on one of the key intersections between investors or limited partners and managers or general partners and also regulators and other advisors, that being estimating and reporting fair value. We'll come to in a minute what we mean by fair value. In other episodes, we'll talk about other aspects of the investor manager relationship how regulators are involved, and the overall ecosystem of alternative investments. When I first started focusing on some of the investor or limited partner issues that are prevalent in the alternative asset space, it was way back in 2001. And I remember speaking with one of the founders of a large private equity firm. And while discussing these GP-LP relations, the GP's perspective was, as a GP, as a general partner, it's our responsibility to listen to our LPs, our limited partners, our investors, and give them all the information they need and ask for. And then he said a little bit with a chuckle, well, but it's also the role of the LP, of the limited partner, to sit quietly in the corner and watch. I think times have changed since 2001. The industry has grown significantly. Regulation has increased. Transparency is expected. And in many ways, the alternative asset industry has become institutionalized. In 2001, if you asked an alternative asset manager or an investor for that matter, what does fair value mean and how is it applied, you would receive several different answers. Some would say fair value means the lower of cost or market. Others would say fair value is, is a willing buyer, willing seller price. And yet others may have said, it doesn't really matter. What matters is in the alternative asset space is the amount of cash that we receive at the end of the day, at the end of the investment partnership, compared to the amount of cash that we put in at the beginning. Well, if you fast forward 20 years to today, in these times of a global pandemic with maybe no end in sight and significant market uncertainty or at least volatility, even though we have public markets that are at or trading near or at all-time highs. Some of us are reminded of a, of a decade or more ago in the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. At that time, fair value was actually vilified by some as a contributing cause to the great financial crisis. But I find that view of 
fair value contributing to the financial crisis as highly flawed. And some would have said that fair value meant fire sale pricing. Well, the truth can't be further from that perspective. Fair value rules as promulgated by the accounting standards, FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, and IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, actually prohibit the use of fire sale pricing. And if we hide the value of an investment, it impacts the ability for an investor to exercise good governance. So that not reporting fair value is actually a very difficult thing. And the fact that we did report fair value during the financial crisis gave greater transparency to what was happening with investments during that very volatile time. Thinking about volatility, last year, as we looked at the public markets, as they crashed in March of 2020, we realized that the global pandemic was upon us. Some pushed at that time for a, a curtailment or a stoppage of fair value reporting as they were concerned about the judgments needed to estimate and support fair value for private investments. But yet again, to exercise governance, to exercise fiduciary duty, it's necessary to understand what investments are worth, even in a time of market dislocation. So many have, have had different perspectives with respect to fair value reporting. And one of the reasons that at least some in the market may, let's say, lack confidence with respect to fair value is because fair value, what it means and how it's used is not well understood. And maybe a short history lesson is helpful as we think about fair value. Many people think about fair value being the requirement to report fair value robustly coming in, in 2006 when FASB issued their new accounting standard harmonizing the view of fair value as at the time it was called Statement 157. It's now been renamed and, and revised and, and is known as ASC or Accounting Standards Codification Topic 820. But it wasn't in 2006 that fair value came to be. It was actually way back before I was born, before many were born that are listening today, with the 1940 Investment Company Act in the United States. With the Investment Company Act, we really got the start of fair value reporting for alternative investments. Well, the alternative asset industry was small in those early days. And it was really the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or known as ERISA, in 1974, which started to open the door to allow the alternative asset industry to flourish and grow in size and breadth. And so as back in the, in the late 1980s, actually the National Venture Capital Association in the United States tried to establish valuation guidelines, but they failed to reach a consensus. But those guidelines were continued to use by much in the industry as a guide to coming to fair value. They said, use lower cost or market even though fair value at that time meant willing buyer, willing seller. So those de facto guidelines, which were non-consensus, but effectively adopted, were used by many. And they were allowed in part because at that time, conservatism, especially conservatism in accounting, was deemed a good thing. Well, in the early 2000s, we had episodes or events such as Enron, and conservative came to mean purposely understating, which was not such a good thing. And in 2006, as I mentioned, FASB relooked at and came up with a new definition of fair value. That new definition of fair value is really adopted now around the world by global accounting standard setters and in many countries with their own local regulations. And that definition of fair value is... Fair value means the price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability. But in the context of alternative assets, it's the price that would be received to sell an asset in an orderly transaction between market participants as of the measurement date. So whenever we talk about fair value, that is the answer that we're trying to come to. But the question is, what would that orderly transaction price be? using market participant assumptions as of the measurement date or the date of valuation. And to come to those conclusions, we need to think about things such as unit of account. We're required to calibrate valuation inputs to a price that is paid if that is a fair value price. 
We do have to use market participant assumptions. We do have to think about orderly transactions. We have to think about how value goes up and down. And the fact that as the holder of the investment, we may not want to sell for a long period of time. We may be saying, well, we're going to hold it for two years, three years, five years. That's not germane to the answering the question, what is fair value? Fair value is a moment in time. What would you receive in that orderly transaction? So you say, all right, we have that, but is that really important? And how do we use that information or how do investors use that information? Is that what they really, really want? One of the things we've learned over time is that sometimes investors or limited partners, they don't always tell their managers or the general partners what they need. They sometimes tell them what they want and what they want is not what they need. They often say, well, we don't really want to see volatility. We don't want to see large movements. But if you start to peel the onion back a bit, what investors really need is fair value. And they need it from a multitude of reasons. And some of those reasons are that investors need to report to their own boards, to their own beneficiaries on a periodic basis, whether that be monthly, quarterly, yearly. And as they report to those beneficiaries or those boards, they need to report on a a common basis to hold certain of their investments at cost while the rest of their portfolio is moving because it's, let's say, actively traded, would basically be comparing apples and oranges. They need to make asset allocation decisions. And again, if they are holding some assets at at an artificially low value, or in some cases at an artificially high value, if they're not changing the value as time goes on, period to period, they may make flawed asset allocation decisions. They need to make interim decisions as to do they re-up, do they invest in a follow-on fund? Well, there's a multitude of reasons on why they would invest with a new manager or with an additional manager, invest in a follow-on fund. Understanding the performance to date of the fund is one of the aspects that goes into it. As they exercise their fiduciary duty, investors need to have a basis for risk monitoring and risk assessment. They need to make their own compensation decisions for their personnel. They need to think about, again, that fiduciary duty. Are the assets that they've deployed with a manager, are they being used or invested in the way that they anticipated, in the way that the contract says? And as it turns out, they have to report in their own financial statements investments on a fair value basis. I mean, there's a few exceptions, but in in most cases, institutional investors must report on a fair value basis. And one of the reasons that they report on a fair value basis is because there's an exception from consolidation. There's an exception from the fund. There's an exception for investors to not consolidate their financial statements, but actually report them on a fair value basis. And so each of those underlying investments need to be reported on a fair value basis. Again, fair value being what would you receive in an orderly transaction using market participant assumptions as of the measurement date. There's a great deal of of judgment that goes into that fair value conclusion. But as we think about it and say, all right, from a multitude of reasons that investor needs fair value, they may not always want it, but they need it. Some have said, well, we don't want volatility. The irony there is volatility exists whether or not you measure it and report it. So volatility it's not really a good reason not to report fair value. And if markets decline, the fair value declines. That makes sense that you would need that information. If you've got a target allocation of 10% to alternative assets, and you had a, a pullback in the value of your alternative assets, and you did not report that, you kept things at cost, well, then you would be under allocated to private equity. And from an overall perspective, you may not be reaching a efficient horizon with the overall investment goals that you have determined because the allocation is flawed if the underlying investments are not reported on a like-like or apples-to-apples basis, all investments being fair value. So as we see, fair value has been around for, in its current form, since really the last financial crisis, 
FASB 157, now ASC Topic 820, came into being in 2006. And I think it was 2011 that the International Accounting Standards Board substantially adopted the same word-for-word wording. The FASB modified some things so that, that ASC Topic 820 and IFRS 13 are, are virtually word-for-word identical. GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, has adopted the same basis for fair value reporting. GASB is important for all of the public pension plans and how they report fair value of investments. And again, various regulators across the world and standard setters have applied the same definition, whether that be China, Singapore, Hong Kong, India, and so forth. Clearly, the European Union, with the adoption of IFRS, uses the same definition. So the alternative asset space has been for what now, 80 years, a fair value world. We've become much more rigorous. We are working to be more reliable in exercising the judgments required to come to fair value. And by using a fair value basis, we can better compare different investments. We can make better decisions as investors and managers work together to create returns that are enhanced for, again, the needs of those investors. Where do we go from here? I think there will continue to be some tweaks. There's always going to be some tension when you have to apply judgment. Again, as I said, that definition requires the use of market participant assumptions. Well, who's the market participant? What would a buyer do at March 31st of 2020? Well, they probably would wait and see. But fair value doesn't allow a wait and see option. We have to say, all right, based on everything that we know, everything that's known and knowable, what would a buyer pay for an investment at the measurement date? It's the same that we have to come to that conclusion and exercise judgment at March of 2020, the same as we do in September of 2021, not knowing exactly when the pandemic will fully be away from us. So all of those things have to go into account as we think about and come to our fair value conclusions. In the future, we know, and we'll we'll talk about that on an upcoming webcast, or we'll probably talk about it on part of our podcast series. FASB is, is going to tweak or is expected to tweak their view on restricted securities where they may not allow a discount. If that's something that sounds concerning to you, let your voice be heard once that exposure draft comes out. Many of you are aware that the SEC has issued new rules with respect to registered investment companies and board's duty in in coming to fair value. We welcome questions as we go through these podcast episodes. You can please send them to podcast at kroll.com, or you can send directly to me, david.larsen, L-A-R-S-E-N, david.larsen at kroll.com. We thank you for listening. We hope that you found this informative and we look forward to your participating in our next episode. Thank you. This has been Episode 1 of Kroll's Outlook, the Alternative Investments Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. And remember to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. On the next episode, we will discuss the impact of private investments being available through target date funds, 401ks, 1940 Investment Company Act funds, collateralized fund obligations, and other investment vehicles.